Hi, everyone. Welcome to the uh, 2019 Berkman Ignite Talks. We're very excited to have you here with us. Um, this is a bit of a highlight of some of the work that some of the community members in the Berkman Klein Center um, think about and work on. Some of this is our direct research. Um, some of this is just our passion projects, um, but all areas that we're deeply, deeply interested in. And I'm so excited uh, to have everyone here doing these five minute auto advanced talks. Um, so we'll definitely be on time because the slides will just keep going. And, and after that, we'll have about 15, 20 minutes for questions from the room on all of these topics. Um, so I'll leave it, leave it there. And I do have to um, say to the room that the Berkman Klein Center lunches are webcast live and recorded for posterity on our website. So with that, I will hand it over to Alexa. Okay, thank you for having me. I'm really excited to do this talk. So I'm gonna talk about um, the argument that data in, in relevant respects is like plastic. So both of these things are produced in large quantities. They have great benefits, they're very useful, but they also, once we take them at large scale, might have very harmful consequences. So some facts on plastic. 300 million tons of plastics are produced every year, which is equivalent to the weight of the entire adult population of the planet. Half of uh, those 300 million tons, 100 million tons, are used just once and then thrown away. That's what we call single-use plastics. Um, plastics have the capacity of being reabsorbed by the earth, but we are at a level of production where most of the plastics we produce cannot be reabsorbed. So a lot of the waste that we produced is here to stay with us on the planet. Eight to 12 million tons of plastic ends up in our oceans every year. Um, and so the waste that we have to deal with increases every year, pretty much. So how to deal with this? Sorry, <laughs> next slide. Um, so plastics obviously have great benefits. So if you had water today, there were plastic glasses, you could take them to the table, you could dispose of them. After the talk, nobody needs to wash them, so very useful. But there are also huge harms to use of plastic. For the planet, obviously, accumulation of waste. For animals, especially marine animals, there are microplastics that they absorb. And for humans, uh, for instance, when we eat fish, we might be absorbing some of these microplastics ourselves. And the problem is we keep producing those plastics. And although we might have moved to a recycling economy, we still haven't moved to a circular economy, which is an economy where we are reabsorbing all of the plastics we produce. Now data. Of, I think many of us know that a lot of data is produced. Uh, by 2020, uh, it is said that each individual will be producing 102 megabytes per minute of data. So data obviously has benefits. If I go on a trip to France, um, I can plan my trip. I uh, can know exactly where I am and I won't get lost, thanks Google. So uh, great benefits, but also great harms. Harms to my ability to participate to the political community and act as a citizen. Harms to my privacy. Harms to my customer behavior through being nudged by advertisements and price discrimination. And yet we keep producing, generating data, incentivizing business models that are heavily reliant on data production, data collection, data accumulation. Um, and the laws also act as financial incentives on this. So why are we comparing the two? Both of these things really useful, both of these things over completely overproduced. Um, each of them at small scale seems to be great. L at large scale produces very abstract and large harms. The difference between them is that data is less visible than plastic, and so maybe we can use the example of plastic to think through some of the harms that data is causing to humanity today, the planet, us, um, etc. So each of these three individuals, corporations, and governments have obligations to try and curb the production of 
plastic and data, I argue. Um, and each of these three have separate types of obligations. So corporations are obviously at the core of why both data and plastic have been proliferating and they have resisted to government regulation, they engage in lobbying, um, and so they need to be taken, made responsible. Individuals also, so all of us are responsible through our consum consumer behavior and purchasing practices and also opt-ins and opt-outs on the internet for how data and plastic are proliferating. So we should check our consumer behavior. Governments uh, should pass laws that are more restrictive, perhaps through taxation, and should also try to coordinate uh, the governance of plastic and data at uh, an international level. So overall, my main claim is that we should make companies accountable, but also take responsibility for trying to curb overproduction of data. And in the same way, we should also do that for plastic. Thank you. Hi, I'm John Collins. I'm an affiliate at the Berkman Klein Center and I work on uh, digital finance issues. I also founded a little nonprofit in the state of Delaware uh, called the First State FinTech Lab. And among other things, we work on access to opportunity. So today I wanna talk about the cashless economy. I think probably many of you are wondering, uh, is there actually a cash economy? And in the words of the Wu-Tang Clan, uh, cash rules everything around me, dollar, dollar bills, y'all. Uh, and there are a lot of dollar, dollar bills, probably surprising to you. Um, in fact, the cash economy in the United States is $2.3 trillion uh, per year. To put that in a little bit of perspective, the overall gross uh, domestic product of the country, the, the size of the economy per year, is um, about $19 trillion. So smart people here, 2.3 out of 19, it's pretty significant, uh, even though many of us probably don't use a ton of cash. Um, so think about like what you have in your wallet right now. I'll pull mine out. Uh, I have a business credit card. I have a personal credit card. I have a debit card. I do have cash because I won a bet this weekend uh, at a Kentucky Derby party, uh, but it's the only reason I have it. Um, and then aside from my wallet, I obviously have a phone, right? A smartphone, in fact, a cracked one, but it still works. And so on here, I've got Venmo, I've got Apple Pay, I've got my Starbucks app. So even in situations where I might not have my wallet, uh, I have this and I can access a lot of commerce nowadays uh, via that. And I'm not alone. Uh, in fact, uh, the Federal Reserve has taken a look at uh, how many payment mechanisms the average American has, and 50% of us have six plus ways that we can pay for things. Uh, so you've seen, and you've seen that increase over time, right? There's only more FinTech applications, more types of credit cards coming out. This is a really bad graph, but I just want you to take a look at that dark line that goes down. That's the amount of cash being used as the two other lines at the top there, which are uh, debit cards and credit cards are increasing, right? And that makes a lot of sense, right? Your increased use of this. Um, Merchants are seeing this as well. So Sweet Green, which is a luxury coleslaw merchant, uh, they uh, found that about 10% of their customers use cash, only 10. So they said, you know what? Uh, we're not gonna accept cash anymore. We're gonna be a cashless store. And there's some reasons for that, good reasons in fact. Uh, it makes transactions uh, quicker. Uh, it makes uh, places that have a lot of cash you know, less susceptible to theft. Um, and so they said, look, we're just gonna be a cashless store. And a number of other stores have, have done this too. And that's all great, right? Like we're a bunch of internet nerds. We've got smartphones. We can go out and go to Bluestone Lane or go to Sweet Green or go wherever uh, is cashless and we can access the, the economy and that's all good. Well, it's not really good. It's not good for everybody. Uh, 8.4 million people in this country are unbanked. That's about six and a half percent of the population. Uh, where I spend a lot of time, Washington DC, uh, about 25% of the African American population is unbanked and about 36% are underbanked. And so what happens is when you have populations that don't have access to financial services, then you create places where uh, they must have access to financial services, uh, you exclude them. And you create, as these cities get more expensive, more and more gentrified areas that, that are exclusionary. And the Civil Rights Act in the United States requires, and in fact um, um, you know, maintains that people have equal access uh, to the enjoyment uh, of public accommodations, like retail goods. Um, so cities and, and jurisdictions and governments are responding to this in different ways. In fact, Massachusetts in 1978 
passed a law saying, look, you got to accept cash everywhere. Um, and you've seen more recently, as these stores have, have um, kind of put out these proposals, other cities follow suit. So the city of Philadelphia more recently, the city of New York, the, city, uh, the state of New Jersey have passed legislation to say, look, you got to accept cash. Um, we're banning these cashless stores. Uh, and so where does that leave us? Unfortunately, I'm not gonna be able to give you any solutions today uh, but in this five minute talk, but on one side, look, we've got a system uh, that, that is making transactions easier and cheaper in some cases, but it's excluding a large part of the population, so that's a problem. Uh, bans are, are blunt policy instruments that certainly solve the problem in part, but they, they don't really get the underlying issue, which is we need to provide better access to financial services for people who don't have it. Um, Part of the solution might be innovation. It might be sort of more fintech applications. Uh, it might be regulation, because a big part of the problem is that uh, fees and expenses related to financial services can be expensive, especially as a percentage of income. Uh, but regardless, what the policy focus needs to be on and should be on is making sure that more underserved um, and underrepresented populations, more diverse groups of people have access to these services and to the wider economy. Thank you. One of the many ways uh, that I did not pay my bills when, uh, before I came back to academia was by being a digital security trainer. And that made me sort of be in a position where I worked with journalists, targeted journalists, uh, which then put me in the digital rights and freedom of expression side of the table. And I couldn't ignore through this work that that side of the table, my side of the table, didn't really get along with the youth rights side because youth rights were a very powerful pretext to augment surveillance capabilities and also to censor people. Uh, I think that this came through really powerful tropes like just say no, stranger danger, think before you sex, 10 reasons not to sex campaigns that put the burden on young people to act better. I think that these frames are ultimately harmful and that there are four ways that um, we are not addressing them well. One is by seeing ourselves as protectors of youth and by seeing youth as conditional citizens, not as subjects of rights today. Also by thinking that all youth are harmed equally without recognizing that marginalized youth are facing the worst of uh, privacy violations and by seeing youth as individual actors rather than addressing the collective responsibility of uh, actors around them. These might sound like all things are doomed and that there are no things to be optimistic about, but I interviewed 18 organizations from Canada to Argentina and I found that there are many things that are being done well in the region. I think their, their work shows that it is possible to do youth privacy work that sees youth as subjects of rights today rather than as conditional citizens, that promotes youth agency, that does intersectional readings on privacy, and that promotes collective responsibility. Co-design is one of the ways that organizations promote agency among youth by promoting their decision making. And Faro Digital in Argentina and the Equality Project in Canada rely on co-design for their campaigns on sexting. This is an image that Faro Digital co-created with youth to address sexting issues, sex with your head. Uh, Equality Project came up with a similar campaign uh, design with young people uh, and this comes to show that when you give people a chance, young people a chance to have a say in the campaigns aimed at them, they're going to move away from just say no old kind of messaging. That is however not the only thing that organizations are doing. In terms of addressing the universal threat model that cybersecurity co uh, communities have long laughed at but youth rights communities have not so much laughed at. Uh, TEDIC in Paraguay and Sulabatsu in Costa Rica are doing targeted digital security workshops, for example, with trans youth to address real name policies in social media and with mothers who sometimes are the sole known users in their households where devices were purchased for young people. In Uruguay, Pensamiento Colectivo calls out uh, victim blaming by shifting away the responsibility from the people who are sexting and placing the burden on the people who are sharing other people's sexts. They came up with this video that quickly went viral, challenging people not to share other people's sexts. And I think that this was a trend that all organizations shared, all organizations creating uh, interactive materials shared, which is that 
they're coming up with local narratives that you seem to be thirsty for, and they quickly go viral. Um, in terms of recognizing youth as subjects of rights today and not as conditional citizens, we have to do analyses that show the ways that the systems around them violate or reinforce the rights. And Internet Lab in Brazil looked at all the judicial outcomes of non-consensual image sharing cases in Sao Paulo and found the ways that the system was failing to protect young women's rights. In Peru, Hiperderecho has a youth league where college students come together to do similar analyses and similar projects that highlight the ways young people are not being served today, but only in potential. Now, this is a very long way to say that some organizations are already undertaking different ways to address youth privacy issues, and not everything is doomed. I think that their work shows us that we can do agency-based work, that we can promote collective responsibility, that we can do intersectional readings on privacy, and that we can definitely work for youth as subjects of rights today, and that we no longer have any pretext to say, just say no. This is a too long, didn't read version of my master's thesis. <laughs> you can read the actual interviews on civic.mit.edu. Uh, there is some more comprehensive summary on the Bergman Klein medium. And if you're interested in youth privacy issues, please look at the Youth and Media Lab work uh, at Bergman Klein. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, everybody. Um, this is hard. Five minutes. Um, so uh, I first started getting into public health and platforms in 2011 when I started um, becoming more aware of my own health. I started becoming a runner and I joined Tumblr to document and journal my, um, my own athletic endeavors, which was a very motivating and healthy uh, practice for me. I got a lot of external motivation and validation for my fitness goals. This is me um, uh, after eating four burritos and running one mile in 35 minutes, which is not the healthiest thing to do. Um, and lots of people cheered me on. Um, but <laughs> uh, I, I think I started to notice on Tumblr that there was this kind of like crossover um, between being part of a, a health focused community and another kind of health focused community that was on, on the more negative side, promoting self-harm and um, eating disorder. Um, and in fact, um, these communities um, kind of rode this gray area. There was this overlap between a pro-health community, um, pro-recovery community, and uh, a another kind of community that was more embracing and glorifying of unhealthy behaviors um, and actions using memes and selfies. Um, it got so uh, challenging and difficult for the platform of Tumblr that they instituted a policy prohibiting uh, self-harm content in 2012. And um, when you search for pro-self-harm content, it would show you a PSA. Um, now, this isn't the first time that ooh, a platform has had to uh, uh, deal with this. In fact, in 2000, uh, the early 2000s, Yahoo and AOL um, passed uh, prohibition ag against this kind of content. Um, and this is what you see on Instagram today when you surface um, anorexia, it gives you a PSA and also promotes pro-health uh, uh, pro content. Um, so I'm interested in how platforms respond to this issue um, because I feel like you can see a similar dynamic and almost a pattern play out across public health um, as, a, as a whole arena. Uh, for instance, if you look at um, vaccines, um, the measles, uh, Measles was effectively eradicated in the United States in 2000, and uh, we just this year, since the beginning of this year, saw 700 cases reported as of now in 22 states. Um, so it's in part in, due to things like this, these, these memes um, that Nat uh, Guinness and and Jamina call uh, part of a misinfodemic, a spread of a particular health outcome or disease facilitated by viral misinformation. Um, and as with self-harm content, there's a response on platforms. There's a kind of grassroots counter speech from people challenging misinfo or with, uh, with humor. I like this on the, on the right here where the uh, original poster's mom says, no, you are fully vaccinated. This is embarrassing. Um, so there's, there's fun ways to deal with it from a grassroots side. <laughs> um, but then the platforms themselves also uh, take their own approach. There's this kind of de-platforming, banning certain forms of conversation. Um, looking at these types of contents, I feel like we're finding uh, challenging, a challenging as part of a pattern can, can show us why uh, it keeps emerging and how effective our responses are. So um, 
if you look at this, this graph, you kind of start with um, a, a map of engagement around misinformation, moving down to normalization of the behavior, and then eventually extremism. Um, alongside uh, trust of existing institutions. Um, and this maps well to the vaccine case. You start with somebody, maybe a concerned parent who looks at vaccine misinfo and says, oh, I'm concerned for the health of my children. Eventually, as they dive deeper and deeper into the rabbit hole, they um, become uh, resistant and eventually participate in, uh, in misinfo. Um, another way to look at this is uh, some researchers have looked at conversations around vaccines on Facebook, um, and they, they find increasingly kind of nuanced um, motivations for how people are embracing this kind of content. Um, so what should platforms be doing to reduce the spread of harmful information around public health? So I have a few different ideas. Um, basically, I, I think that there should be, uh, number one, engaging the public health community, supporting efforts with counter speech, um, and also instituting uh, use, uh, getting help from the public health community to uh, establish good practices. Um, second, I feel like there there should be we should avoid some instincts to uh, look at this as an all or nothing approach. Um, there may be cases where um, the blunt force of banning is a really good idea, and there may be cases where we might benefit better more from um, intervening in these communities. Um, third, I would also think about every feature on your platform as its own platform. So not just the stream of information on Facebook, but the recommendation algorithms, the um, engagement, the likes, those are all their own little ways of engaging and they can all be used for harm. Uh, fourth and finally, I'd also consider the public health approach for all harmful behavior on platforms. So um, think about uh, radicalization and hate speech and dehumanization um, using the same kind of approach. Um, thank you very much, I really appreciate your time. Good afternoon. Um, really happy to be able to be among these uh, distinguished speakers and to go after Dan, which I think connects with what I'm going to talk about with you today, and that is trust, or at least ideas about what trust is and how it comes about. So we need a definition of trust, and there's many definitions of trust from economics, from sociology, from marketing, and trust is a willingness to be vulnerable. Now, why be vulnerable? Well, vulnerability is based on a set of beliefs or a willingness to believe certain things about the thing in which you are placing your trust. And I think these beliefs are really important, so I'm going to talk about them in a second. So one of the first beliefs we have has to do with the fairness of the thing in which you're putting your trust. So you believe that this thing is going to act justly, that there's not going to be any discrimination related to you or your use or um, trusting in that thing. We talk about goodness and not necessarily the nutritional value, but we're talking about goodness on the scale of right or wrong, the thing you're placing your trust in falls on the good side, the right side of goodness, right? Related to goodness is benevolence. Now, benevolence is the actual charitable act, the actual doing of the good thing. So we're talking about behavior here that's really important for trust or the belief. Now, I put strength and ability together because I think they go together. So strength, we're talking about the power to do the thing. And ability, we're talking about the technical know-how to perform the act here. But I think they go together. Uh, importantly. We also have honesty, that you believe that there's not going to be any deception related to placing your trust in the thing. Please note that the pictures may have nothing to do with what I'm talking about right now. <laughs> so <laughs> we also have predictability, and that is that although we can't see all of what the thing is going to do, we can forecast or we can try to predict what's going to happen when we place our trust in that thing, that organization, or that individual. So we're really talking about a relationship. So we have a trustor and we have a trustee. The trustor places the trust. The trustee takes in the trust, right? So it's a relationship. Now, maybe more people in a relationship as well, as you know. Now, relationships can be of two kinds. One kind is a symmetric relationship. So both sides are providing in equal ways. So a symbiotic relationship, both sides mirror imaging each other. But then there's the other kind of relationship, and that's asymmetric. 
And that is one side has a different level of trust or value being placed in a relationship. Now this is really important because in an asymmetric relation, one takes more risk or has a higher burden of risk than the other side. So say if you place your personal information in a system, the burden of risk is on you and not necessarily on the system uh, in this case. So how do we get in an asymmetric relationship? Persuasion, right? So you persuade a person or a thing to place their trust in you based on aesthetics, other cues, the smile I'm giving you telling you that what I'm saying is correct, right? But I really want you to act in a certain way. I'm looking for action from you, some kind of behavior that demonstrates you're placing your trust in me as a trustee of whatever it is that you're giving me. And basically, I'm act asking you to have a positive outlook or a positive expectation about what it is that I'm going to do for you in this trust relationship. I'm asking you to believe in me in some way, right? Now, really what I'm asking you to do is give me something of value, right? Whether it's data, whether it's money, whether it's kindness, right? I'm asking for something valuable. And that's contextual, right? So the context is really going to matter here. But really, I'm forming a relationship of interdependence. That means I'm going to rely on you for something, whether it's efficiency, for help, whatever the case may be, we're forming some kind of reliance on each other. And this means our relationship is transactional. Now transactions, people think of as a bad thing, but really it's about the exchange of something for another thing, right? So if we look back in this relationship, when trust breaks down, it is because something is missing in relation to those characteristics regarding trust, honesty, integrity, those kinds of things. Thank you. Hi, thank you uh, everyone for giving me this chance to be here and to share with you uh, a topic that really matters to me. So just a few more seconds. <laughs> Selvona is a Zulu greeting, which literally means, it means hello, but it actually means I see you, I sense you, I recognize your humanity, I affirm the humanity inside of you, I honor the dignity that exists inside of you. And Selvona is based off of the idea that we are interconnected, we depend upon each other. Therefore, we are connected in ways that cannot be broken or separated. And to try to do so is a violation uh, is, is a loss to our own humanity. And if we look into the underlying causes of the social problems that we have today, which are now being worsened by technology, we can actually realize that this is really due to a breakdown of uh, being able to recognize the humanity that exists in, in others. So this is a broken view of what humanity is. This is the neglecting of the social connections, the social cohesion that exists, and ignoring those relations and pursuing self-interest um, at the expense of what's good for society. And this leads to social breakage. This is when relationships within society break apart, and this ultimately leads to the violation of human rights, the failure to recognize the humanity of others. And now we're living in a society where we have technology facilitating social breakage. And if we look at some of the strongest critiques of artificial intelligence, um, they truly lie at the failure of technology to recognize the humanity of others. And so we look at isolation, this is the failure to, to build technology with a community in mind, a failure to recognize the humanity of others. And we can also look into how we, may, we might place biases into technology. And the embedding of biases and the universal application of biases uh, in technology without taking into account the structural inequalities that may exist, this is also a failure to recognize the humanity um, of, of others. And when we have content recommendation systems that are based off of the commodification of user data, um, systems that are based off of uh, surveillance and, uh, and uh, trying to maximize user uh, uh, company profits at the expense of others, this is also failure to recognize the humanity of others. And alienation, 
right? Being able to, um, alienate, alienating users from the, uh, from the value of the product of, of their labor. This is also disregarding the humanity of others. And we see this as well with the centralization of data, which really amounts to the centralization of power. And when we have private entities that have amassed so much power, uh, or a few people that control so much power at the expense of society, this is also a risk to our own humanity. Now, when there's a loss of humanity, there must be a way to bridge the gap. There must be a way to reconcile this chasm that's been caused by the failure to recognize the humanity of others. And we have seen several examples that have happened in the, in the African continent. Uh, in 1994, Rwanda had a genocide where about 15% of the population was killed in a matter of a few months. This is a social breakage. This is a loss of the relations that exist in society. But the government took a process of national reconciliation. And we've seen the same process happening in Sierra Leone after the Civil War. Uh, after a decade of fighting, the government took a national process of truth and reconciliation to restore the wounds caused by a decade of fighting. And we've seen a similar situation as well in South Africa. After decades of white minority rule of uh, the indigenous Africans, um, the government took on a process of truth and national reconciliation. And the idea was that whenever there's a breakage in society, we're supposed to restore and restore the, the, the humanity of others. So ultimately, reconciliation and restoration rests on the ideas of equity, transformative justice, restorative justice. And the idea is that when something is broken, we must fix it. When equity is missing, we must restore it into our technology. And uh, as we lead with, with equity, we must seek meaningful engagement, meaningful inclusion, empower communities to shape the future of their technologies and what they desire out of um, the tools we build. So ultimately, safer AI really begins with truly seeing each other and truly recognizing the humanity of each other. Salvana. Um, yes, I, these are things I learned uh, collecting secrets. I did do a research project in an art installation over a couple of years um, based on collecting other people's secrets and redistributing them. It was done in collaboration with Jessica Yurkovsky, who is here today. So everybody think about something private in your digital life, in your text messages, emails, past or present. Do you have something? Yes, everybody does. This project was exploring that, the fact that we have these things that we are leaving traces of, um, but not necessarily thinking about the future that we're leaving them to. Uh, in survey research, we discovered that while people would be very keen to read the emails of their great-grandparents had they kept them, they were less inclined to want their great-grandchildren to read theirs. So we designed this installation uh, where you have a computer that asks you for a secret, and if you type one in and push enter, there's a little printer uh, that prints somebody else's secret in return, which you can then take with you. Uh, it's super simple, but it had some more elements. Uh, sometimes it was in a, a public, more um, brightly lit environment, like on the left. Sometimes it was in a, a dark, more private space, like on the right. Um, there was also sound and projection um, and some other like complicating of the algorithm that we did. Um, it showed, showed internationally, so in those cases it was adapted in um, different languages or you know, included different languages. So you see um, Berlin and, and Warsaw here. Um, <clears throat> and as a result, I learned a lot of things. So I'm going to give you just a very brief synopsis of what some of those things are today. And I love how it relates to all these other topics of misinformation and trust and sexting, everything. Um, secrets are weird and funny. Um, I don't mean this in a judgmental way, but rather in an endearing and appreciative way. Um, people are uh, complex and strange and often don't have an opportunity to share those things um, with others. Uh, people are extremely willing to share secrets um, in this format. Um, even after they realize, having received someone else's secret, that someone else is going to receive theirs, often people return to the installation enthusiastically to share more. <laughs> we can't know when a secret is true. Um, we may have an idea that some secrets seem more true, some secrets seem less true, but we can't really know, which brings up questions about our relationship to information online more broadly. We also make assumptions about other people's secrets, or rather the people who submit the secrets. For example, if you read a secret about a bully, you might be maybe more inclined to think it's from a male. Or if you read a secret about an eating disorder, you might think it's more likely to be from a female. 
Obviously, this is not always the case. I'm going to give you a little sample of the audio secrets. I killed a bunny when I was seven. I have a crush on my boss. I keep LSD in my philosophy books. I can pick pockets. I enjoy it. I've lied about my identity my whole My life. friend microwaved her hamster and it died. I think <laughs> Bernie Sanders is handsome. <laughs> Um, secrets, uh, secrets are also very common. Um, not surprisingly, infidelity is among the highest frequency. There's many others. Um, and yet, secrets um, also can make us feel more connected and bring out our humanness. Technologies so often make us feel kind of dis disembodied and disconnected. But there's something about the sharing and the anonymity um, that we should think about um, as we bring more technology into our lives. They also make people happy, uh, even the dark ones. Um, and I think that it's probably because when you realize that everybody is fucked up and not just you are fucked up, uh, it kind of makes you feel better. Um, we also tell ourselves stories about what the machines are doing. Um, there's, we, anecdotally, we heard theories about why you were, people were receiving certain secrets or what was happening with the remote printers and why they got a certain sequence. And this is our uh, inclination is to connect the dots with technologies, um, but it's useful to shine a light on that inclination itself. Anonymity and intimacy can lead to connection and compassion. Um, usually we don't have anonymity and intimacy at the same time. And this is something that can be really valuable because um, you don't know who these secrets belong to. And lastly, fragments misrepresent. Obviously, if we think about our corpuses of our online data, that, that's not who we are. That's just one kind of slice or one representation of us. So we should think about how we're leaving information in the world. These are two of my favorite secrets that came in um, during the duration of the installation. <laughs> and uh, lastly, I want to thank uh, my collaborators on this project, and uh, they're listed up here on the screen. Thank you very much. OK. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. I'm Kathy Pham. I normally talk about tech and ethics, but today I'm going to tell you about um, the belief that pineapples will cause incontinence forever, postpartum traditions, and maternal health around the world. Here are some things Vietnamese aunties will say when you give birth. Don't eat pineapple because it's too cold. No lemonade because it's too sour. And both will give you incontinence forever. Forget seafood because it'll make you itchy. And no sushi or crab or shrimp. And no tank tops, keep your body warm, cover your arms, don't walk upstairs, and no bathing or washing your hair for one full month. Put on socks at all time, remember to keep warm, drink some black chicken soup and some hot ginger. Um, these are some of the things my Vietnamese mom and aunties would say to me after I gave birth to my daughter. And for any woman who walks the streets of Little Saigon in Orange County, um, or San Jose with the baby, you can be certain that if you're walking too fast, if you're going upstairs, if you're not wearing socks, if you're wearing a sleeveless shirt, a Vietnamese stranger will stop you and tell you how to live your life. <laughs> Most of us here in the United States will have these kinds of reactions. We, many of us westernized immigrant children, we say we think it's crazy, we know better, we yawn and cringe and are frustrated when we, we think about this, but maybe they're onto something. So let's explore this more. So there's something called the sitting month. Um, it exists in Vietnam and China and many other places. It's one month of rest, learning to nurse, no household chores, people coming to help, no washing your hair and no eating cold foods, but the intent is to focus on rest and recovery. In Japan, there's a term that means quiet and peace and pampering. The new mom rests and bonds with her baby. Japanese women have less uterine diseases than American women, and many in the medical community believe it's because of the time to recover. Um, and in Latin cultures, there's La Quarantina, 40 days. Female relatives handle day-to-day -day chores, cooking, cleaning, taking care of children, and the new mo mom just spawns and takes care of the baby. This was my mom um, and my four-week-old daughter. My mom died just one week after this photo, and it was taken um, a, a month after she, um, I gave birth, and I really think she hung around so she can really fulfill her duties as a mom to me to take care of me for one month. So in the United States, we focus so much on the prenatal, the baby showers, the celebration of the baby, everybody wants to hold the baby. We don't focus on what happens to the mom once the baby is out. This leaves many women in danger. The infant mortality rate in the U.S. is so high. Let's look at another culture, the Himba tribe, where the breastfeeding rate is really high. 
Why? It's the grandmothers. Women stay with their moms and grandmothers for months after birth for support, recovery, guidance, care. In parts of China, new moms go to these luxurious recovery centers with 24-hour supervision, trained nurses, nutritionists, doctors, etc. And, and someone is always ensuring that all the rules are followed at all time. Um, and by contrast, in the United States, we have the shortest hospital stays. Women are sent home with very little support, very little training. In other countries, they learn to breastfeed and exercises for recovery, and the nurses check in on you to make sure you're okay. The lack of postpartum care is one of the factors that leads to the rising maternal mortality rate here in the United States. We have an average of 26 deaths per 100,000 live births. That's seven times higher than Finland, five times higher than Australia, and three times higher than the UK. Black women here in the U US have a significantly worse risk. Their rates are doubled at 44 deaths per 100,000 live births. Black expectant mothers um, in the United States die at about the same rate as women in countries with much, much less developed medical systems. Every year in the United States, 900 women die from pregnancy or childbirth related causes and about 65,000 women nearly die. That's the worst um, record in the developed world. So in addition to the narrative of those staggering figures, the United States is the only country of our peers to have zero paid parental leave. We do not value or understand the need for women to recover after giving birth. This contributes to our problems of maternal deaths here in the United States. You know, so we don't have to follow all these rules and traditions and beliefs. Go ahead, eat the pineapple, bathe, wear tank tops. But we can learn a thing or two from these cultures that value recovery, care, and the lives of women. Maybe just one month. One month of support and care can turn around the rate of dying women. So we all can help. If you're a policy person, change the law of parental leave. If you're in healthcare, change hospital protocol. And for the rest of us, be supportive coworkers, build better companies, build better cultures, and be part of the village that helps really bring life into the world and care for the woman that makes that possible. Uh, like the forward era? When I'm ready? All right. So my name's Salome Fulyun, um, and I'm going to tell you a story about a river, specifically the Cuyahoga River. And I think it's also a lesson in how we've solved particular problems, by which I mean collective systemic problems that require collective systemic solutions. It's also a lesson in how a river can go from a flow of water and a part of a cycle in nature to a thing of productive extractive value and use in industry to a living practice of commons management and moderation of balancing many interests, both human and ecological. But first I wanna place it. So the Cuyahoga River is in Northeast Ohio. It runs through Cleveland and into Lake Erie. But before Cleveland even existed, this river was valuable. It was valuable to the native people who lived there, the Iroquois and to wildlife. Now, at the turn of the last century, the river was part of the industrial explosion happening on the banks of Lake Erie. It powered electricity and dams. It was used to ship goods. And with industrialization, we see the first shift in our core logic about this river. It becomes something else, a thing of production, seen in terms of its use for economic reasons and in terms of extractive value. And where there's industrial growth, there's pollution. At times, the Cuyahoga was one of the most polluted rivers in the US. And by the mid-century, the reach from Akron to Cleveland was totally devoid of fish. Sections of the river were covered in a brown, oily film. Large quantities of black oil floated in slicks several inches thick in which debris and trash often caught. The color changed from gray-brown to rust-brown as the river wound downstream, and animal life did not exist. One fateful day in June of 1969, the Cuyahoga River caught fire. Now, this wasn't actually the first time this river caught fire. It had caught fire 13 times before, the first in 1868 and the largest in 1952. But something about this was pretty interesting, which is weird because pollution wasn't a big story at the time. Here we see oil slicks around the Statue of Liberty and smog in New York and LA. But something about this June fire sparked change. The story was picked up by Time Magazine, which described the Cuyahoga as the river that oozes rather than flows and in which people do not drown but decay. And this powerful image was circulated nationally during a wake-up moment. It helped spur environmental uh, change in the US and it was really picked up by the environmental movement. And this led to fixes, both local and federal. So we saw the Clean Water Act passed, the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement was passed in the region, and ultimately, it helped lead to the creation of the EPA. 
And I think what we see here is we really changed the way we manage water. And here we see a second shift in our core logic of rivers. As something with useful productive purposes, sure, but also something that if mismanaged can create risks of toxicity and harm. And also, finally, something that has value and meaning beyond its role in production and for humans. And I think in short, this is a shifting attitude from what I'll call an extractive approach to an ecosystemic or ecological approach. From just thinking about what can be taken to what are permissible uses, what are unacceptable toxicities, all with an eye to managing the overall systemic health of something. So managing a river requires communications across groups between localities up and downstream. And it requires explicitly thinking about the trade-offs between agricultural, industrial, and the natural purposes of a river. And I think this approach has really helped. It's really helped the Cuyahoga River. This is a picture of it today. Um, it has fish in it. People can even swim in it. Um, it's not perfect. It still has pollution, but it's greatly improved. And I also think that the lesson of the Cuyahoga can be a way for us to think about what other collective systemic problems we're facing and for which we can think about similar collective systemic solutions. So my own work is in the data economy where I see systemic problems like toxic practices, the overextraction of resources, all happening in a highly relational and interconnected ecosystem of information. And I think we're seeing a lot of externality or almost sort of pollutive effects in this economy. And I think that we can similarly to our approach to rivers think about collective systemic solutions here that switch us to an ecological approach to data. Something that has productive value, that poses systemic risks, but which also stems from aspects of us that are non-economic and that have illegible value as well. So a lot of people in this room and in my larger, economy, larger community may think that the current state of data collection is a bit of a dumpster fire. From the effects of election security, rise of hate speech online, architectures of hyperconnection and personalization, as, long as, as well as sort of underlying all of that, the data imperative driving companies to ever more seamless data extraction. But I like to think about the state of our data economy as more like a river on fire. And that's something that we know how to fix. Thank you. There's the last line. Oh, this is great. We can end on a dumpster fire note. So now we have about 10 minutes till one, and then we still have, I believe, time afterwards as well for just questions from the room. I know that was a lot. I'll bring up a slide with, um, yeah, let me, with everyone's name so you can be reminded of what we all talked about. Um, but we'll, yeah, we'll leave, we'll open up the room for questions. Um, we have Electra with um, data and plastic, John and the cashless economy. Oh, there it is. John. Oops, sorry. Marielle, and just the just say no to just say no, youth and privacy. Dan telling us more about public health and content moderation, Jasmine and trust. Sabello and the Ubuntu framework um, for AI, Newman and Secrets, um, myself with maternal health and pineapples, and Salome with the story of a river and regulation. Um, that was a lot, I know. Um, thank you for joining us, and, let us and, and let's open up for questions on any of these topics. We have mic runners too, I think, right? Hi, um, I have a question for, the, for Salome. Uh, what do you think is gonna be the burning river in the digital economy? Is there anything that can shock us so much that we're gonna go into collective action? Yeah, I mean, I think we're kind of living it right now. Um, I think that if you look at sort of how the media has been covering technology, I think you can sort of in and around the time of Cambridge Analytica notice a really stark shift. So I think we're sort of having our burning river moment um, or at least I'm optimistic that this is our burning river moment. Um, things can always get worse, but I hope they get better. <laughs> thank you. Hi, uh, thank you all for great talks. I'm particularly concerned as now a grandfather, because my kids are about 30 now, 
um, and as a policy maker, because I'm a graduate of the Kennedy School, uh, on this issue of the internet, Mariel, which I believe you're Latin, um, where do you think, or anybody here, where do you think we should draw the line between the right to freedom of speech, freedom of communication, and actually the right to, you know, protect our kids? You know, there's a difference there, and legally I still don't understand what to do. I think the key, my, my personal take on this is that the key is that we need to stop posing it as it's either freedom of expression or child protection, but realizing that kids have a, the right to freedom of expression and they also have the right to be protected. And so do adults. And we know that there are many adults who are marginalized in Latin America and in other parts of the world who have seen the right to protection not be a, respected. And so I think that rather than think of it as a protection versus freedom of expression, we need to look at the regulatory frameworks that are starting to think of two at the same time. Um, to the young woman, a uh, Vietnamese woman who spoke about um, maternal um, the one month after. Um, what I was wondering is how you think that that can, if, they, if that can have some sort of a national implication, because I realize that different cultures do it differently. And even some people who were born within a culture have chosen to be vegan. So they would step outside of it and they would actually have to create their own version of it. But I think that women and women's health and this whole thing is enormously undervalued. We see it with the lack of child care. But how do you think we can implement it on a, a sort of a, a nationwide basis that the value of, of uh, women and especially um, pre and post um, maternity? Yeah, I think with any theory of change, it takes lots of different levers. I think um, a It'd be great if every organization that employed women would give them the time to recover as, as needed. And then I also think that people need to recognize the, what happens after someone gives birth. That and even just knowing things like people bleed for an extra four weeks or that it really takes um, a month to at least start to really recover. And just an understanding of every person in society as a whole, not just the policymakers and people in power, to really support your team members, your coworkers, or even just people that, like your neighbors um, when they give, give birth. And then also for healthcare providers to really change our hospital protocol. Right now you're sent home after two days. Um, insurance makes you go home um, if, if, if you're doing like a normal delivery. Um, so for insurance and healthcare providers also to recognize that perhaps some women need more time as well. So I think it takes all levers. Question for Dan. Um, do um, some of what you were talking about seem to be uh, kind of public health authorities getting in, uh, involved in public conversations to uh, kind of co combat misinformation? But do you think platforms themselves, like Facebook, have uh, a, 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 a duty to intervene in the way that? anti-vax material is spreading on their services? Because I, I presume they're going to be very uh, resistant to anything that kind of alienates their customer base or alienates a particular bit of their customer base. That's a good question. Um, I, I, I think that uh, platforms generally do have a duty to um, have some sort of voice in the kind of content that they permit. And um, some platforms do this I feel like very well in, in, in interesting ways. Um, Wikipedia has um, a very well internally regulated community that establishes a lot of things um, via norms. Um, Metafilter is another example where they have uh, moderators who are um, regulating you know, the, the, the way the conversation happens and what is unacceptable or acceptable. Um, I think that there, there are ways of um, instituting um, 
better norms practices on these platforms without necessarily establishing policies. But we aren't even seeing that from Facebook in a lot of ways. Um, so I'd be, I'd be, I think that's like at least a place to start, to start to look at Facebook. And maybe um, Facebook has talked about having this um, external you know, advisory board to help, you know, help them shape up a little bit. Uh, I don't like, you know, <laughs> have any hope for that necessarily, but we're gonna see what happens. Hi, I have so many questions, but um, I, I'll ask Kathy one. Um, I'm old, so I've watched attitudes towards maternal recovery change over time. I remember at some point hearing the mantra over and over um, that, you know, women used to be out in the fields and would, you know, give birth and, you know, would just go right back out into the fields. And I'm not sure where that came from. Um, but, um, I mean, the, the sort of look at how other societies think about maternal health seems a whole lot more sane, um, you know, than, than some push to um, get back into the fields. Um, um, you know, the same day, which I assume, you know, was part of trying not to cast women as these weak things for whom, you know, pregnancy was a long, you know, you shouldn't hire a woman, she'll get pregnant and then she'll have to recover or whatever. Um, could you talk about the sort of, call it the overall philosophy of, you know, women's rights and equality and how it plays out if we start embodying um, a more sane approach to, you know, dealing with the burdens of giving birth? Oh man, that's such a big question. Um, anyone else can weigh in as well. <laughs> and so I think in a nutshell, the recognition that at the, you know, asking for I think three to six months of, of recovery time might be too much for in this country at this time, but at the very least just a recognition that we don't have to be proud of two days later going to start, like, train for a marathon or like get out in the field or get out to work and have this like pride of honor on us. I think when women do it to each other as well, it's like this encouragement of getting back out there, um, but also with society not recognizing, um, I think the amount of recovery that it takes. And one month to six weeks or so is not that long. I remember when I worked at Google, someone maybe could take off a month to go climb like Mount Kilimanjaro, and that was seen as so cool. But you take off a month to go and have a baby and like something is wrong with you. And so it's like this, like, you know, that, that, that's those six weeks, whether it be a sabbatical to write a book, whether it to be like to go hike the PC, um, H, the, the trail in Cal yeah, the, the uh, Pacific Coast Trail, or, or go sit at home and watch Netflix all day, or have a baby. It's, um, I see how sometimes certain types of leaves are seen as a great thing that enhances your career and your pride, like you're, you're given, um, you're even, uh, you're getting a lot of kudos from your coworkers for it and then you take leave um, for something like even caregiving or, or giving birth or any of those things and it's seen as some kind of like a detriment. So perhaps somehow level out that playing field that if you just, um, it's not a negative thing. Um, and it'd be great if people saw it as a positive thing, but at the very least view it as just the same as someone going off to go and take some leave for something else, and that it's not necessarily a bad, it's not a bad thing. I just, um, if it's, well, so just one sort of quick anecdote is that um, when Kathy went out on leave for her last child, she sent out a note to our community sharing that she was taking some time away from you know, all the emails and everything. And I was so inspired by that. And I took it as like a, wow, that's the way I want to do it. So I feel like that's another way that to kind of promote this is to, to show, to kind of like show the path that we want to be on so far as we can and like show others that. So when I saw that, I was like, that's, that's how I'm going to do it. <laughs> you know, just like, I'm not available. <laughs> yeah. And I'll tell anyone really that will listen, like, oh, I got to go and pump now. Sorry, I need like five minutes or I need, I think it's good to kind of maybe normalize. I think there was an article recently, and I'll hand it over, that where people were just showing breastfeeding through the years. And there were periods of time when it was definitely not a bad thing to just breastfeed in public. And we've somehow reversed course. And so 
there's, I mean, there's a lot to unpack, unpack there. So maybe we can just normalize having children and not treat it like some medical condition. Hi, thank you for a great set of uh, talks. Um, I have a question for Jasmine and maybe also Sabello. I like the frameworks that you are invoking sort of for trust and the expectations we have, the values that we care about, and also for your, uh, Sabella, for your framework for IA. I was just wondering, uh, Jasmine, where I'm thinking there's great possibilities to apply this. I was just wondering if you had looked at your models in certain contexts, and I'm thinking about the cashless economy, the mental, uh, the, uh, the medical health, the public, uh, you know, information, disinformation, et cetera. I'm just wondering where you might apply it, and also, Sabella, where else you might look for your framework. Well, when I was looking for this information, I looked across disciplines, so computational science, sociology, marketing slash business, um, economics, and they all had kind of this unified idea about vulnerability and expectations of behavior. So I think that a definition or a framework like this can be used across um, disciplines, across uh, like uh, sectors, technology for instance, sociology, all of those where we could like uh, try to see where trust breaks down or why trust is sustainable and related to some of these factors. Because it's basically across all disciplines, they have this like basic, basic, basic idea about what trust is and the factors that go into it. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think this applies to various disciplines, whether it's law or business or technology or just social issues. Um, for example, if we look at how the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was done uh, in uh, Rwanda and in South Africa, uh, especially in South Africa, uh, it wasn't really meant for um, retribution. It was meant to be restorative. And so this is a value that we see in African cultures where the idea is that if there's a break in society, uh, it's not about casting blame who's wrong or, or whatever the case is. It's how, how can we best restore balance and restore harmony into society? And so, uh, you know, so we have different legal systems from different parts of the world, which are based off of this idea. And I think uh, even if businesses were able to operate uh, without putting uh, profits above people, but actually um, 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 focusing on social cohesion and social action on how to maximize that, uh, we could have different business practices. Uh, so ultimately to say, I think, um, Many of the issues that we experience and we face today uh, at, um, in the African philosophy are really lie at the failure of recognizing other people as equal human beings who deserve protection, who deserve dignity. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask John um, about the cashless society idea. Um, there, there is a, a lot of work on financial exclusion and microfinance. And I was just wondering, um, was the problem that you're talking about that there aren't the right kind of banks <laughs> or that, that some of the people who are unbanked should stay unbanked? What, um, you think it would be a solution to have more banks of a new kind, or? Yeah, I'm, so I don't know, I, all the above. I mean, I, I think, um, you know, there's a lot of reasons why people are underbanked and unbanked. Uh, some of it, yeah, and, and FinTech, however you want to describe it, and I hate to use that term, that can be a solution. I mean, there's actually been a lot of good studies. Some of them have been industry, but it makes logical sense that um, lenders, for example, to small businesses, um, there's a much higher uh, acceptance rate of uh, women and minority-owned businesses because the, the, the theory goes that um, traditionally in these communities, banks have not served their interests. And so by going through a, and this kind of goes to frankly the secrets conversation, that's what made me think of this, Where there, that there might be a fintech solution. Um, no, I mean, look, there's there's all kinds of reasons. I think f when I think through some of them, and and you look at some of the data out there, a lot of it has to do with with just how expensive maintaining maintaining various accounts can be, um, especially as a percentage of income. Um, some of it has to do again with like deep rooted 
uh, historical distrust of these institutions because they haven't served interests well. It, it's it's a really multivariate, um, and you know, again, a ban. Uh, my personal opinion is I think it is effective, though not the most elegant solution, certainly. And so it likely is going to be a mix of policy solutions that that arrive at. Um, people being able to access these services. Because, I mean, look, I, I live most of the time in Washington, D.C. It's not too different from Boston. It's not too different from New York. There is a sweet green next to a soul cycle, next to a bluestone lane, next to, and I love all of these places. Um, but if you do, if they all don't accept cash, you've then created these islands within cities that are already getting crazy expensive where people literally cannot go and engage with society. That would seem to me to be a problem um, that we got to figure out, so. I also wanted to add to the whole financial inclusion, and I draw uh, an example from uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, where a model based on Ubuntu exists. Uh, half of the GDP in the African continent is in the informal sector, and so most of the population is actually unbanked, and they still find ways to still carry out, carry out financial transactions. And so uh, throughout the entire Sub-Saharan African region, you find systems where the community gets together to, um, to organize as a collective to uh, support a particular person. So the first month, the community might give money to this particular family. And then the next month, it goes into another family. This is like all over, in, in many African countries. Oh, they might have a group savings uh, program where um, they all decide to save to buy a particular thing. And people have been able to send their kids to school, buy houses, buy cars. So there are, there are alternative ways for financial inclusion. Uh, and these are based on social trust, uh, as you were saying, uh, interdependency and social capital. I think there's examples in the United States too, right? Collectives, cooperatives who have a resource or somebody has something that another person needs or wants, and so they come together to exchange value related, related to those things that they have or, or need, yeah. Sorry, I know we're going over. First of all, I just want to say thank you all so, so much for these amazing talks. They were, they're really excellent models for, um, I think, like ways of presenting information. And it's just, it's just very inspirational. I wish I could always be that concise, which I'm not being now. Um, <laughs> so um, I have two qu quick questions for you, Dan, and for you, Kathy. Um, I have a really personal interest in in and passion for reproductive health and justice and just public health in general. And I'm curious, Dan, um, what you think about like the role of journalists in um, the like health and mis misinfo space, um, just because so many of, I think, like these hidden worlds on social media in spaces like Tumblr, for instance, um, aren't visible to the rest of the public. Um, and I think that might make it difficult for these policy considerations to be passed um, and for um, perhaps like more um, like insidious ways of, of influencing or, or mitigating the spread of health misinfo online. And I'm curious what, how you think like journalists might be able to push some of that to the forefront. I, I think if we knew, you know, some of the top health misinfo stories that might help um, push the conversation forward. And I'd just be, yeah, I'd love to hear your thoughts. And then Kathy, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on how you think all of this is shifting uh, in the digital age in the US and how people who don't have health insurance at all or are, don't get like paid leave if they're in the gig economy, um, if they you know work for Uber for instance, like how, how we can keep pushing this narrative forward like even in the digital space and perhaps work even harder for that. And also um, I think in the US specifically, it, I've noticed a theme in almost like a co-option of some of these um, practices where like white women now have more access to midwives and doulas um, and are able to like take this time for themselves. And I'm also wondering if you have any thoughts on how we can make sure that this like caretaking is as inclusive as possible and that it like is actually meeting the audience, um, the audiences that it should and yeah, especially all of the stats that you gave. So thank you so much. Um, I'll just jump on the first question real quick. Um, there's a couple things I feel like uh, journalism can do um, for misinformation around public health. And one is, um, I think there's a project by the 
I think it's the News Literacy Initiative. I'm gonna find the name. Um, but they've um, been helping uh, build curricula for schools um, that involve basically running uh, students through quizzes of, of uh, identifying um, misinformation versus uh, factual information online. So um, in that way, like helping to build a, like a, a new generation of folks who can you know, better discern truth from fiction online. And um, a lot of uh, the, um, the problem with misinformation, I feel like has, has come from just the lack of trust in, in the media. So there's, a, there's a, a lot of ways that I don't feel like traditional journalism can really you know, help that because the, trust, the mistrust is with them. Um, but I, I feel like um, there's some really good space for um, you know, journalis journalists and um, you know, kind of startup journalists especially to embed in um, social networks. Um, and especially in spaces where this misinformation is coming from, um, to better get to know the kind of anthropology of these spaces, um, and to talk back to platforms and explain to them what is happening on their platforms because there's this huge gap between what the platforms are, are, are doing when they are creating their space and what is actually happening there. Um, so connecting those dots I feel like is super important. Let's try to keep this short. And the first, I guess, your question was twofold, the gig economy, um, uh, and then um, the world where women have access to duels, et cetera. Um, I don't know, I think maybe other folks have better answers. I feel like this is a much bigger just healthcare question where you know, when you work in the gig economy and you work, you work for these companies, but not really, they don't provide you any benefits. So in some cases they can say, oh, it's flexible and you can do what you want, but also you don't have benefits. So if you have a kid and you, you could either choose between feeding your kid or going to work. Um, that's your reality. Um, I, don't, I don't know what the answer really there is beyond the bigger discussion of companies having a much bigger responsibility to their employees in the, in the gig economy and having to really think through that together as a, um, as a society. Uh, and then what you brought up with doulas and midwives is so interesting. On one hand, you have the woman in Cambridge where I gave birth to my last daughter where you can you know, get a doula or a midwife, choose to have a baby at home and have this very like cushy, crunchy lifestyle. Um, and, and then you have women of color in this country that can't even get good health care at a hospital when they deliver. Um, so there's a huge gap there and there's a lot to unpack there as well. Um, I don't really know the right answer beyond really just yelling that this is a problem and hopefully some in, the, in this room or elsewhere can think of how to really address and recognize these issues. I think we're going to leave it there. Thank you yeah. all so much for coming and sharing with us today. Yeah.